how we can flip the paradigm of where disease comes from to start to look at holistic methods of, of dealing with that. I want to look at the whole pest scenario. You know, why are these pests on the scene? How do we go about learning what they are? And then what do we key into so that we have better odds of success in terms of dealing with them? You know, part of this is, and, and it's the part I really love, is, is you have to get involved. You know, it's not just, you know, I don't write for magazines because they want like the three steps and it's got to be in a thousand words and then they're done and that's got to cover everywhere in the country and what's fascinating about fruit growing is even here within this circle most of us are within the range of a hundred miles of here some of you are dealing with boars and some of you are not some of you are overwhelmed by kakulio and you're losing your crop when it's the size of a marble and you don't even know it and others it's the apple maggot fly and, and some of these we share but every site is unique and so part of it is I have to talk about this whole big picture but you over the course of time are going to whittle that down to where you're going to know it's this one and this one and sometimes it's this one and there are certain years where this one is more problematic and it's maybe it's a really dry year that apple maggot fly is delayed and you see them in your late apples so there's a there's a lot of nuance to this so for those of you who are just thinking of planting trees, it'll only take me about an hour to talk you out of it. <laughs> for those of you who've been growing fruit trees for a long time, you know, we can go really zero in on some of the particulars there. So some of what I say today will be right for you and useful right now. Other bits will be, you'll start to get the idea of this is how that circle, that weaving fits together, but you're not ready for that bit, and it's kind of going to go over you. But it's there, and someday you might need it. And we just have to trust that. It's, it's like we plant a young tree, and in those early years, we're dedicated to growing branch structure, so it's going to be a strong tree, so it can hold up the weight of that crop. And we're talking years of development there, and we have years to come up to speed and figure out what's going on. And, and sometimes it's just that hearing that little bit, and you suddenly understand if I just tweak that that slightly I'm gonna to start to get a handle on the moth problem that I've been facing you know then there's a lot of variables that are way beyond our control you know temperature gets down to 15 20 below you're probably gonna lose your peach buds and there's not much you can do about that on the other hand there are some smart things that you can do so that you don't lose the tree in a few years just because you just really put it in the wrong place so as we go through all this, um, I really invite questions. So if, if you're not quite understanding what I'm saying or what you're particularly concerned about seems to be related to what I'm talking about, let's go down those avenues and those cul-de-sacs because there's something to be learned by everyone. So one of the things that um, I've become really enamored with, you know, when you write books, I, I wrote Apple Grower in 1998 and then that got revised in 2005 and now the holistic orchard has come out a year ago and, and that was a three or four year process where I get to write for six weeks and I have to go to do carpentry so I have money so I can write for another six weeks <laughs> at some point. It, it takes time and and you know it's coming you finish that book you go through this whole process of, of getting all the drawings in place and permission for photos and you've gone through several rounds of edits and and you're feeling like you just got everything tight and then the book is printed and suddenly you start building a list of things you want to add <laughs> and things you want to change and it, it's it's amazing <coughs> and there's just a very brief window where you like can just relax about it anyway one of the things i've taken further since getting that book out in print has been this concept of, of nutrient density and and really understanding more plant metabolism really understanding what makes for a healthy plant. So I want to start with that. I've actually gotten to the point where there's a couple of my talks I open with one slide just explaining what is healthy plant metabolism. And I tell people, that's all I need to show you. Everything you need to know is on this slide. And it, and it <coughs> is, except we need to understand the nuance of some of those things. So we're out here in this, in this incredible green world. And all these plants are taking the energy of the sunlight and through photosynthesis, producing sugars with the nutrients they have available through their root system. And in the, in the case of trees, um, a lot of those nutrients are being stored in the inner bark. 
and the trees do that storage at a certain point. We're going to talk about the root cycles of what's going on with the tree, and that'll relate to our task. But irregardless if we're here or not, the plants are here, they're green, and they are making sugars from the sunlight by taking carbon and creating photosynthates. And part of that process involves taking up trace minerals so that it's that photosynthesis process is really efficient. And if a plant is, doesn't have access to a broad spectrum of balanced nutrition, it doesn't necessarily thrive. So right there is one of the first flags, this notion of trace minerals and, and having a, a balanced approach to soil chemistry and plant nutrition. So sometimes people get into really overstocking the pantry in a lot of respects. If we get into talking about soil chemistry today, I'm going to really emphasize certain soil fertility ratios because, again, it's about balance. And a really cool thing is, is just letting go of the human notion that we know more than the plants and, and understanding that when we have all sorts of organic matter, fungal foods available and, and we're encouraging the mycorrhizal fungi, a lot of those decisions of what makes balance mm -hmm. is done by the plant. It's done by the biology. So our job is, is really, we don't really need to get that involved with it. We just need to understand there are certain things we need to make sure we're touching base with. Plants go on from there to create proteins. And that process of creating protein is where nitrogen comes into play. And nitrogen is delivered by the soil food web, all the organisms in the soil. You know, when people use those words, I need to fertilize my trees, it's, it's so, so wrong. It's, what we have to understand is nutrition comes by the, from the mouths of the microbes, and that's the, the soil fungi and the bacteria and the seeds that are breaking down organic matter and in turn consuming sometimes one another, sometimes it's the protozoa and the nematodes, but that microbe eating microbe, one of the waste products is nitrogen. And that waste product, nitrogen comes out in the form of ammonium. And when a fruit tree gets its nitrogen in the form of ammonium, it's much less susceptible to disease. On the other hand, when the nitrogen comes in the form of nitrates, you have a much greater likelihood of, of having to deal with more things like pear scab or apple scab or, or any of the fungal diseases. And there is something that goes in the soil, on in the soil, that determines that. So. If we're talking about a more disturbed place, a place where a development has gone in, a garden where we till, uh, a garden where we take compost that's turned five times in 30 days to generate lots of heat, all that is very bacterial. And when we go to an undisturbed place into the woods, we're talking about a place where the fungi start to be much greater proportion than the bacteria. So deep, deep in the woods, in an old growth forest, that fungal biomass will be on the order of a hundred times greater than the bacterial biomass. In, in the garden, in the yard, the bacteria biomass is going to be greater. And when we get to the forest edge, there's kind of a transition zone. You see the plant species are changing, and, and we go from the annuals, the goosefoot, and what have you that pop up where ground has been disturbed, to then more perennial plants, and then you start to have goldenrod and raspberries and the first succession species of the forest. All of, of that change of plants, that transition, represents more different organic matter being available to the biology. And as the amount of cellulose and lignans goes up, the fungal biomass has more to work with. And on the forest edge, it's on the order of 10 times greater than the bacterial biomass in the garden. And it's, it's that 10 to 1 number that we're really looking for to create in fruits for fruit trees, for fruit orchards. And, and part of that forest edge thing is that's also where there's lots of sunlight. So it's, it's a combination of the sunlight and the right biology. So let's take that back to the nitrogen. When it's a bacterial dominated soil, there are nitrifying bacteria. And, and all this action is taking place in the root zone of the tree. So the, the closer you get to the feeder roots, the, the more the density of the microbes increases. And when there are nitrifying bacteria, they take that ammonium and convert it to nitrate. So in a bacterial dominated soil, and, and I'm, I'm breaking the world into bacterial and fungal, and, and both are important. It's not like we don't want the bacterial. It's, it's part of the, the whole scene as well. But there's things we do that kind of push it one way or the other. So I want to get you to understand 
You know, am I pushing it in that fungal direction, or was that more of a bacterial act? Anyway, with lots of nitrifying bacteria, you're going to get nitrates, and, and that in turn is going to result in a protein synthesis process that is not as optimal as it could be. And that means that the plant produces more soluble amino acids. And this is relevant because that's one of the flags for pests. When aphids come really zone in on a tree, part of it is due to the fact that the plant metabolism is off. We, we might think, oh, that plant looks sickly or yellow, but it, it's really the whole metabolism process, this converting of nutrients. So we want to do things that's going to have more of a connection to the ammonium form of nitrogen. And when we have a fungally dominated soil, and here I'm talking about both the saprophytic fungi, the decomposers, and I'm also talking about the mycorrhizal fungi, which are species that form this symbiotic relationship with roots. They, they coat the surface of the roots and they also penetrate, some of the species penetrate in there. And how do we see those? Whenever we see mushrooms growing, we know we're in a fungal place. Mushrooms are kind of like a badge of honor. But anyway, in that fungally dominated soil, with a greater biomass of fungi, <coughs> that rhizosphere area is more acidic, and that works against nitrifying bacteria. And so the ammonium form of nitrogen is thus taken up by the plant, and the protein synthesis process is optimized. And so now you have plants not producing foods that call in the pests. You have plants not producing foods that sometimes favor the disease. Uh, apple scab feeds off of an amino acid called asparagine. And ag again, I'm throwing out lots of words here right now, and just just let it go through. <laughs> Some of it needs to register, but <laughs> that, that point about fungal dominance, 10 to 1, the forest edge ecology is, is where this is all coming from. Plants go on from there to produce secondary plant metabolites. This is where the essential oils, the fats, and a number of, of what are really the immune compounds, the phytochemistry by which a plant resists disease. Um, and plants have a greater ability to do that if they're getting their nutrition in the form of partially built carbohydrates. So, so plant roots can take up simple ions, and that's one thing, and they can work with that. But in a fungally dominated soil system, there is much more kind of partially built nutrients being taken up by the root system. And so that allows the plant to save some energy. And that saving of energy allows the plant to put more effort into the production of those secondary plant metabolites, a lot of which we don't understand. However, uh, the one grouping we call phytoalexins, and that's composed of things like terpenoids and flavonoids. So as a, I'm an herbalist, my wife is truly, truly an herbalist. <laughs> I'm kind of, I'm an herbal husband, is what I should say. That's its own <laughs> distinction. And, and I've always locked into, in talking about plant medicines, not a deep understanding of all the constituents, because there's hundreds, and, and a lot of how herbal medicine works is through synergy. But, but there's certain groupings of compounds that catch my interest. So here in, in the realm of working with holistic disease management, when I hear the words terpenoids or flavonoids, I know that that's the kind of phytochemistry that a plant produces to help ward off disease. I want to see that happen. And so when I talk about neem oil as part of my holistic spray program, and I'll, I'll explain what neem oil is and we'll get into the details of it, it's really high in terpenoids. And the, the fact that terpenoids are in the spray material I'm applying to the plant helps stimulate more production of those terpenoids. When I use seaweed as part of my spray mix, and I pretty much use seaweed in any time I spray, um, part of that you can think of as just a mega vitamin pill, because there's all kinds of trace minerals. But another aspect of seaweed is it has a cytokinin hormone. And cytokinin helps synthesize the production of flavonoids in the plant that we spray. And that's part of that immune function of the plant. So we'll, we'll get into what that immune function is, but, but right now, it's the fact that, this is fun. I mean, all of you see me looking at you and you think I'm looking at you, but I'm like seeing my PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> and I'm, I'm trying to see several slides ahead so I can stay coherent. <laughs> I shouldn't be fast because now I broke it. Um, and I allow myself like three of these moments where I totally forget why I'm here and what I'm doing. Um, Seaweed. 
seaweed, flavonoids, <laughs> plant immune oil. function, herbal so it, it, so it has a lot to do with how that plant resists disease. And yes, the herbal husband thing. Um, you know, in herbal medicine, we're really interested in a lot of those compounds. Like right now, hawthorn is just coming into bloom. And when those blooms open, white is an indication of flavonoids and, and little stamens where the pollen is are, are beautiful bright pink. This is when I pick hawthorn. And it's because of the flavonoids and their impact as a heart medicine mm -hmm. that hawthorn is a really valuable herb for what I do. That That's the sidetrack. Um, anyway, in an herbicide strip, in a place where the grass is mown regularly and thus becomes kind of the dominant understory plant because mowing really knocks back a lot of the tap-rooted weeds and some other reasons as well, there I don't get that partially constructed nutrition. But in a place where there's a much greater fungal biomass, I do. So I have trees that are able to do more of that. So this is the point where I don't need to really tell you anything more. <laughs> You just have to know that you have to create this fungal dominance. You have to provide the right kind of fungal foods, and a lot of these things will take off. Now, there's a, a school of thought that if we optimize nutrition totally, and the, the trace minerals are all there, and everything's in balance, and we have that ammonium nitrate thing also somewhat in balance, that we will get plants that optimize that protein synthesis process to such an extent that we can measure it and we use a, re a refractometer is used to measure the bricks which is a measure of the soluble solids and some people think the sugars but it's, it's also the proteins and if we get plants with a really high bricks on the order of like 14, 16, 18 then we will have crops that don't have any disease or pest issues and I kind of support that particularly with vegetables um, but fruit trees are a little bit different in that we have some really ornery pests out there. And there are years, there are cycles when the fungal disease can be really, really rampant. And I just, of, of, I'm of the experience that there are certain things I need to do to nudge it a little bit further. So there's a continuum here. Some of us are home orchardists, and if we got a couple bushels of several varieties of, of different apples and the other fruits were growing, we'd be completely happy. Great. But it all begins with the fact that this is a fungal-dominated soil ecology, which is being fed fungal foods, which are the right type to provide those humic and fulvic acids, which is long-term humus. And from there, we get into growing good fruit. But we have the advantages of nitrogen being delivered as ammonium. That's really important on the disease resistance front. We have the advantages of partially built nutrition being taken up by the plant, so it's more able to produce the phytochemicals that helps it resist disease. And if you do these sorts of things, you may be satisfied. But we'll, we'll look again at certain pests that maybe will keep you from being quite satisfied. Uh, and we'll look also at, at where fungal disease comes from. So similarly, taking that notion of there's a bacterial way to do things and a fungal way to do things, Let's talk about orchard compost. So, garden compost is one where a typical recipe, a really simple way of, of thinking about it is you make layers of half green and half brown materials. So green materials are those that are really nitrogen rich. So that's the vegetable waste from the kitchen, the grass clippings, alfalfa meal, um, fresh cow manure, which even though it looks brown, was green the day before. It's high in nitrogen. And the brown materials are high in carbon. And by kind of adhering to that half brown, half green, you will end up with a pile which is a carbon to nitrogen ratio on the order of 25 to 1. And not atypically, people turn that pile deliberately because the introduction of air fuels the consumption of organic matter by the bacteria, and that generates heat. And the heat is what's going to kill off weed seeds, and it's also going to kill off potential pathogens like E. coli. You can also do garden compost without turning the pile. And, and you're going to actually hear a theme in me. You know, I grew up in a small town, had a yard. I was the oldest son. I was the one who was always sent out to mow the grass until I learned to deliberately hit, like, the, the water pipe and the things that stuck up. And then my dad would make my younger brother mow the grass, and I was relieved of that. So naturally, I've come up with a whole orcharding system based on doing less. 
and I justify it through the biology. You know, that's just the true confession. Um, anyway, <laughs> where did that come from? I do that, and then I'm in trouble. The next book, is that the title? Different kinds book? of compost. Yeah, compost. thank you, I'm on orchard compost. compost. So, I build a static pile, and I take care to really adhere to that half brown, half green, but I also, as part of my brown layer, I always throw in a layer of earth, because that's, that's biology, that's microbes. I take care to, in the winter, make a dusting of things like alfalfa meal, because in the winter I don't have as much nitrogenous material. And so I build a pile that has a lot more going for it. And my piles are, the stacks of cedar logs, I just build it that way. And every six months, I come in with my tractor and I move that pile. And it's not really, it's mostly broken down, the edges are not so much. And I move it, and half of it's going to be spread on the garden. And again, I, I do a lot of things rough. There's, there's a good argument for doing things fungally in the garden as well. Most of us do it way too bacterially. And a lot of, when we get into talking about mycorrhizal fungi, these organisms that form this symbiotic relationship with roots, well, 95% of the plants on this planet have that relationship. And they're, when we grow garlic or we grow tomatoes, if they had that relationship going for them, they're going to be a healthier, more, ro more robust crop. Anyhow, half the spread used in the garden. Maybe it's incorporated just before doing a cover crop. That often works for me because, again, my compost is not really fine and brown and, and neat. But half of it goes somewhere on the edge of the orchard, maybe even literally on the edge of the woods, to be mixed with the same volume of rainial wood chips. Or, in some cases, I'll have horse manure that I aged for a year or two. So in horse manure, the bedding is typically like pine shavings. It's not what I want, but a year or two later, it's okay. It's, it's got a contribution. It's not as good as Ramiel wood chips, but it's useful, as long as you understand how to work with it. And so that mixture of more woodsy debris, more woodsy chips into the compost, lifts the carbon to nitrogen ratio to more like 40 to 1. That's something I want. And that pile is going to sit for six months, sometimes a year, before I use it. And it's in that non-disturbance phase that the fungi are going to start to dominate in that. And when I spread it, it's going to look half like wood chips. It doesn't break down that much, but you'll see a lot of white hyphal strands in it. And when I tell you about my sprays for holistic disease management, part of it's going to be the neem oil, and part of it's going to be liquid fish. And the, the thing that is in those particular materials is the fatty acids. And those fatty acids fuel a fungal, fuel fungi in a wonderful way. So when I spray the orchard and I spray the ground under my trees, and we'll, we'll get into the nuance of that, I also go by my compost pile every time and spray it because it's a fungal food. I'm encouraging the fungi that I want. A couple more refinements on orchard compost. In the fall, starting around the end of August, all through September, all through October, all through November, into December when the snow covers the ground and the ground and or the ground freezes solid. This is bad. Nope, it's not a tick. Good. <laughs> that would really throw me off. In the fall, trees have a permanent root system. And there's two times in the year when feeder roots come off those permanent roots to gather nutrition. And in those fall months is when all the nutrients that are there in the spring are being stored in the bark. So when I spread compost in the orchard, I can most optimize its value by spreading when about half to two-thirds of the leaves have fallen. And I'm going to explain about building a fungal cake underneath the trees with the fallen leaves. And part of that is about the fact that by covering some of the leaves, I'm going to have less leaves there next spring. So when we learn about apple scab disease, that overwinters on the fallen leaves. And the more I can decompose leaves, the less I'll have of that disease in my immediate zone underneath the tree. And the other thing is, I know those feeder roots are out there now. So I want to take a veil of not just the biology in the compost, but also the nutrition that's there. And one of the things I do with orchard compost is in mid-late August, if I decide I want to up the levels of trace minerals and 
add like kelp meal or something like azomite clay, some soil amendments, or I know I need a little more calcium in my orchard soil, not a whole lot, I'm not talking about the level of changing pH, but just get some more calcium, I might add gypsum. And I'll take 50 pound bags of those soil amendments and cover the orchard compost piles and just roughly fork it in. Because I know in the course of the next six to eight weeks, compost food web is going to digest that soil amendment and those nutrients are going to be in a more bioavailable form mm -hmm. when I spread the compost in fall when feeder roots are gathering nutrition. And in that sense, you're able to get more bang for the buck out of your purchase of soil amendments. So I call those soil <coughs> condiments. It's like putting mustard or, or ketchup on your burger. Um, but it's, it's the same notion, but it all is tied to the, what the biology is doing and when those nutrients are going to be absorbed by the tree roots. That's orchard compost. That's my next slide. <laughs> <laughs> Is that kind of used as a mulch on top? Okay, compost rates. So I'm going to talk about the things I do to maximize leaf decomposition. In fact, we're there. Let's let's do that. So we haven't really zeroed in on the, the mechanics of a fungal disease, but in the case of apple scab and pear scab, um, one of the things that takes place in the fall is that spore sacs are formed so that next spring when they mature that's where the disease organism is going to land on the leaves and on the fruitlets to cause potentially cause infections and so I want to the more I can decompose that the better so there are some people who actually rake up the leaves and pull them out of some out from where their trees are put them in plastic bags and send them to, to some other planet or something or hopefully to D acres or to my farm but uh, I don't like that because that no one goes and bags up the leaves on the edge of the forest. That's part of nature's fertility cycle. I want that organic matter. You know, that's part of the cycle of what's going on with my trees. So I do three of four steps. The first is when you prepare orchard ground, one of the things you'll look at on the soil test is pH. And ideally, that an orchard soil pH is in the range of 6.3 to 6.7. And to get it into that range to be less acidic, we add some type of lime. And that lime might be high acidic lime, it might be dolomitic lime, which has magnesium component. And when we're prepping soil in, in the initial time when we're going to transition, we might be cover cropping, we might be tilling or plowing that in. We're able to incorporate that lime. And a lot of times, soil recommendations for that step of going from unworked ground to ground that has a pH in a more favorable range, the amount of lime being applied will be on the order of one to two tons per acre. And, th and that's a lot of lime. It's a biological compromise. But because I'm wanting to make that leap into more of a place that's going to be fertile for fruit trees, and I'm going to incorporate it into the soil and thus get it deeper, lime just spread on the surface goes down about an inch per year. So when I incorporate it, I'm getting more calcium and magnesium deeper in the soil. So I'm just taking advantage of that, even though it's a biological compromise. But I would never apply that rate of lime once the trees are planted, and I can't incorporate it. It would be too much of a wump to the biology. And so there's the incorporation rates, and then there's maintenance rates. And a maintenance rate of lime might be two, 400 pounds per acre. And just to break that down from a tree perspective, usually I'm going to talk about things in a per acre basis. And you're going to have to translate. If I say it takes me 100 or 150 gallons of spray to do my acre, you know, you have a four gallon backpack sprayer and you know you get coverage on five dwarf trees or maybe two semi dwarf trees. And so you just have to know that to wet things thoroughly, and you'll learn this with what it takes. Similarly, with soil amendments, I'm talking on a per acre basis. When we plant, when I plant trees on freestanding rootstock that's somewhat vigorous, so I, I use a rootstock called MM111 and BUD118, and that just stands for the research station where these rootstocks were developed. I know I, some of you don't know what rootstocks are yet. Some of you heard last night a little bit about it. Um, but they've been selected because they show a certain vigor and a uniformity of growth. And in some cases, they have resistances to things like woolly apple aphid and et cetera, et cetera. 
So orchardists choose a certain rootstock for a certain system. And, and we'll, we can talk about dwarf trees versus freestanding trees. But when I plant trees with that 75 to 80 percent vigor, and I'm planting rows, typically they're going to be spaced 16 feet apart, and the rows are going to be 24 feet apart. And that spacing amounts to about 110, 120 trees to an acre. So for doing math on the fly, we're going to call that 100. So when I talk about 400 pounds of lime that I've decided I need, when I have a tree that I'm allotting an 8-foot radius to, a 16-foot diameter, and that's pretty typical. Again, if you grow smaller trees, this changes, but that, that math is pretty typical. That means that I'm talking about 4 pounds of lime being spread on that tree to achieve what I'm shooting for. So I'm not necessarily covering all my ground. I'm covering underneath the tree, from the drip line down to a few feet beyond there. That's, that's the zone I typically am working with in terms of fertility and mulching, and that's what I call the fungal duff zone. So now we've simplified it. So we're talking two to four pounds of lime per acre. It's based on checking in on a soil test every few years. You don't just do this randomly. Ideally, you want to kind of have a reason why you're doing this. So in those years that I need to do lime, I wait till about a third of the leaves have fallen, and that's when I apply the lime. And I do that because when lime is on those fallen leaves, it makes them more alkaline, and that hinders the reproductive act of the scab. And it does so on the order of 50 to 90 percent. You know, I don't do liming automatically, I want to emphasize that, but if I needed that maintenance rate, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that it's going to help suppress some of this inoculum source the next spring. The next thing I come in and do, and you know, I'm still picking apples. It doesn't like, for me, this happens all in one day. This happens over the course of a, like a month. But one of the next things I'm going to do is some form of mowing. And in the spring, I'm going to talk about mowing with the, either a sigh or a sickle bar for specific reasons for the fungi and the feeder roots. But in the fall, I really want to chop everything up. And I'm doing that because, A, the more leaves are chopped up, the less likely they are to be there the next fall, uh, spring. Um, and two, I really want to reduce vole cover. If I leave everything high and don't mow, then the vole populations will explode and the hawks can't find them as well. But when it's all chopped up and more cleaned up, it's going to be much more exposure and, and nature will take care of some of those voles. When I do that, that has been shown to reduce potential inoculum the next spring 50 to 90%. And, you know, it keys to what you have for a mower. You know, I have a walk-behind BCS with a brush mower attachment, so I kind of just zoom in and out underneath the tree. If you have a rotary mower that shoots to the side, you'll do a similar thing, but you can also do a circle around to blow that mulch in. So now I've got lower leaves, if I limed, less likely to have the spores. Now I have chopped leaves on top of that. I'm just kind of adding to the crescendo. Somewhere around the same time, I also come in and I may spread the compost now to kind of anchor that fungal cake, or the next step I might do is what I call the fall holistic spray. So when I talk about a holistic spray, my core recipe consists of things like pure neem oil and a liquid fish. In the growing season, it also includes seaweed, but in the fall, I'm not including the seaweed and some form of biology. That might be compost tea, it might be effective microbes. Now, I'm going to get into explaining the whys of those particular things. Just take it as gospel right now, that is what I'm using. And I'm doing, what I'm doing is spraying fatty acids. When about 50 to 60 percent of the leaves are off, I'm spraying both the ground to help decompose what's already down. I'm also spraying the leaves that are on the tree that will fall, so they're going to have more fats, they're more digestible and so the biology is more likely to take care of those later falling leaves but I'm also spraying the branch structure of the tree I'm spraying into the bark crevices and I'm spraying into the bud scales if the leaf comes off the bud scale is more revealed and that has real relevance to certain diseases that overwinter in the bud scales and in the bark crevices and when I introduce the fats um, that's helping to weaken those overwintering diseases, protective mechanism, they have a lipid coating, a fat coating. And on top of that, there's more biology added, and that concept of microbe eating microbe, 
this is where a big part of my lessening disease. And if we're talking about peach, leaf, curl, fungi, or bacterial spot, I'd actually get even more involved with this idea. Right now, it's just the notion that I want to take advantage of getting fats out there to decompose leaves, um, spraying it on the tree. Another thing a tree does, this is phenomenal if you think about it, and the popple tree is the teacher of this. And the popple tree has, sometimes people from a distance kind of think, oh, that might be white birch. But you get closer and you see a popple tree is more of a greenish bark. That's the tree that most reveals the fact that bark is able to photosynthesize. And the popple tree is actually like a leaf all during the winter. It's actually helping get nutrition. And start thinking that way, you start re recognizing that bark can also absorb nutrients and fats in particular. So I'm also feeding the tree. There's, there's a lot of overlap of what I do. And you know, in, in when I have an hour to talk to people, I just tell them, do this. Trust me, do this. <laughs> and But I find the more I understand that this is what's going on, and in particular, the more I kind of visualize that when I'm out there, that I, I invest my spirit and into the intention. Mm. And I'm my consciousness is like right there with the fungi and the microbe eating that fungal spore that's overwintering or the feeder root. You know, I can, I don't meditate per se or do yoga and I know I should. My wife is encouraging me and I'll get there maybe. But <laughs> I can take my mind right now and be at the tip of a feeder root and I can see the rhizosphere. And it's not like that's a gift or anything or you have to do this, but I think it makes it A, richer and B, it empowers you as a co-creator. I never said that publicly. <laughs> but it's a big part of it, I think. Anyway, so here's this fall holistic spray doing all these different things. And whether I do the compost before that or after just kind of ties to the order of me doing things. But I end up with what's basically a fungal cake where a lot of fungal foods have been added to this. The compost has the right kind of biology and it's... Uh, everything is at that fungal sweet spot, 40 to 1, when feeder roots are taking up nutrition for next spring. And, and you can see how that's, I hope to see, that that's a really important step. You're setting up next season to be in a really good place. And when we, when I come in and consult for an orchard, you know, one of the things I think about is, well, is this a clean or orchard or a dirty orchard? And if no one's done any kind of biological decomposition work, or rake the leaves and put them in a plastic bag. It's a dirty orchard. And and you go from having a potential of several t tens of thousands of spores that potentially could infect you to having several hundreds of thousands of spores that could infect you. And so you're much more likely to see disease because that orchard has more potential to offer disease. So this is an important element. When someone says, my apples get these spots. What do I do? Well, there's things you do at different points, and it's based on this understanding of, of what's going on with the trees. I know there was somewhere I was before that. Sorry, I'll try to stop saying that. I'll just stare at the fire. You're doing holistic spares <laughs> in the fall. I know, but I kind of feel like I finished that one. Ah. I have a question. Okay. Um, the 40 to 1 versus the 10 to 1, what's the difference? And what's the 40 to 1? So when I am using that number 40 to 1, I'm talking about the carbon to nitrogen ratio of the organic matter. So and when we make compost... The fungal to bacterial. Right. Okay. So the 40 to 1 is a carbon to nitrogen ratio. With a 10 to 1 is you can do a, a biological assay of a soil, and you send it to the soil food web lab, and they'll report to you the fungal biomass. And you don't have to do this, but the fungal biomass is this amount, the bacterial biomass is this amount, and if it's on the order of approaching 10 to 1, that's forest edge ecology. That's our goal. Um, and there are things that you can do. I had friends in Australia. And again, where you are in terms of what resources are available and what do you do in your life, um, like us as medicinal herb farmers, we have those raspberry canes. Again. It's, it's really about diversity, but my friends in Australia, their resource was, there's a lot of, of wheat grown around them, so they had access to all kinds of straw, really cheap. 
and so they're growing dwarf trees and they're mulching really really thick with straw and that, that's a, a fine thing but it wasn't woodsy it wasn't the soluble lignans and when they did a biological assay of their soil they found a fungal biomass on the order of two to three times that of the bacterial it wasn't quite the forest edge it was in the right direction but it didn't have all the fungal foods that make that possible and I don't necessarily go and do this bio essay with people I consult with. If people have the money and want to do this, it costs about $200. I'll encourage it just so that they get the lesson that there are certain things we do that help us get to where we're going. But I've already told you enough. You know, it's, if you understand Ramiel wood chips and, and all kind of a diverse way of going about it, and you understand orchard compost is not garden compost you're going to be doing things that are going to get you to where you're going. So another element in that is those mycorrhizal fungi. So depending on our system, you know, you may be converting a mown yard to planting orchard trees. And that doesn't necessarily mean the whole yard, but just spots in this yard. And it's it's been a place that Maybe you just bought this property and the previous people were fertilizing the grass with nitrate fertilizer and it's, it's likely a place that's not that fungal. Or you're converting a hay field and you plow and you cultivate and you do cover cropping for a year or two. You're disturbing things. For good reason, there's things, reasons why we might want to do that. Or you come in and you clear an overgrown field or an actual woodlot for fruit trees. And you do it in such a way that you, you've learned that or you think you've learned that you want to get rid of all those root systems to make way for the fruit tree root systems. And so a bulldozer comes in and clears things and makes everything flat and pristine. That's a very, very disturbed place. It's not going to be fungal. You know, when I come in and clear an overgrown pasture, I might pull some of the stumps that are in what will be the row because I want a cover crop for a year, but I always leave stumps cut flush to the ground because I want those other root systems. And if black cherry sprouts again from the base and there's stump sprouts, I come and mow it. You know, that's a source of Ramiel wood chips growing right there in my orchard. I, I like that. But that's thinking biologically versus thinking human in terms of, oh, i got to clean everything up so I make room for my apple roots. Anyhow, often the setting we put fruit trees is not necessarily a fungal place. And there may be trees near enough that within a couple years, three, four years, the fungi from the root systems of the hardwoods reach the fruit trees that we planted. Or maybe they're so far back, it's going to be seven, eight years. Maybe they're not really the right species in your vicinity because it's, it's not a tree place. Every fruit tree, for the most part, that you plant is going to come as a barren slate. The rootstock was grown on big rootstock farms out west, Washington, Oregon places where they fumigate the soil to rotate in a new round of rootstock every couple of years. And that's just how rootstock are grown. And even nurseries with organic inclinations like St. Lawrence Nurseries in New York, Potsdam, New York, or Fedco Trees in Maine, all of us are getting a rootstock, for the most part, from those sources. And so they don't come with the fungal connection in place. And then some nurseries, like Bill McKintley of St. Lawrence Nurseries, he actually dips every tree he sends out in mycorrhizal root inoculum so that when you get it, whether you know it or not, you're getting this good thing in place. Mm -hmm. um, but other than Bill, I don't know anyone who deliberately does that. Some of the Fedco individual growers might do something like that, but I don't know that. They don't all necessarily do it. So one of the things that's really worth doing when you get that tree is there's no reason to wait two, three, seven years to have that connection in place. You want that connection. And so there are mycorrhizal products that are sold either as a root gel, as a root gel dip, or just as a powder. And they consist typically of 10 to 12 species, two or three of which are going to be right for your particular climatic zone, ecosystem, and the species of what you're planting. And places like BioOrganics, now out of Pennsylvania, or Mike Aramphithuis out in Oregon, and those those websites can be found on my website, the GrowOrganicApples.com website. There's a grower resource page with links. So whenever I talk about neem oil or biological product or soil labs that give you results that are more of the type I like to see to reflect biology, 
you'll find links on that page. So one of the things you want to do is just inoculate your trees. And, you know, the bioorganics powder does something like 200 trees. Well, that's a lot for a home orchardist. You can find an amount that works for you. But you can also buy inoculum that you can use as well where you plant your garlic, where you plant your tomatoes. Because, again, it's a mix of species. So it has a value more than just your fruit trees. Um, if you've already planted your trees and you're thinking it was a suburban lot, it was bulldozed, <laughs> and that was two years ago, don't go and dig up the tree to put inoculum on it. Rather, understand that just going down a couple inches through the, the duff layer where roots are going to be for that fruit tree and putting inoculum there will work. And you don't necessarily have to buy the inoculum. These trees here, I'm sure, have the right kind of mycorrhizae for fruit trees. And there's definitely some big healthy apples that have been here for a long time. And to go to those trees and take just like a quart container of soil from around their roots. It has to be in the vicinity of the roots. And then bring it to your trees. You know, I like, when I'm taking from nature, I always like to ask. Nature is pretty generous, but it's, it's part of the cycle. Um, but that's, that's like grandmother making sourdough bread. And every time you saved a little bit of the, the dough, because that dough mixed in with the new dough would have the yeast culture. It doesn't take much in terms of fungal spores and fragment, uh, hyphae fragments to get in touch with the roots of our fruit trees and it all takes off. And these mycorrhizae play even more important roles as well. So when, let's go through the feeder root thing because we haven't really covered that. So we, we know now about the fall feeder root flush, why I spread compost in the fall and bioavailable bio soil and then it's tied to that. In the spring, the buds pop, all that is being driven by nutrition that's stored in the bark. And at first, as those buds are growing and coming into flower, grass is just starting to grow, getting to be three, four inches tall. But the soil's still quite cold. It's a sleepy place. Things are not really taking place there. And as we come into bloom time, and we can see this on the trees now, um, not only are, are Leave, more leaves growing, leaf surfaces expanding, flowers are coming out, but shoots are starting to elongate. And they're going to grow two, three, maybe as much as eight inches in this first phase. And shoots can grow because down below, things are still basically asleep. So the permanent root system of the fruit tree is there, obviously, but the feeder roots, the feeder hair, root hairs, that's part of that aspect of the roots is not happening yet. And as we go into fruit set, and we're almost at that point, there's going to be a few weeks where those shoots that were growing and elongating stop. And that is because feeder roots are going through, are now happening down below. And a feeder root grows to be an inch, maybe as long as two inches long. And so it allows the tree to access a little bit more of a nutrient zone. But without the mycorrhizal fungi, an inch or two is not that far to get more phosphorus or potassium. The mycorrhizal fungi send out filamentous hyphae that bring back more nutrition and water to the tree and can go a hundred times further than the root system does. So that's one aspect of why this is so important. Another aspect of the mycorrhizae is that because those roots are coated with the good fungi, the bad fungi that cause things like crown rot or root rot don't have the ability to get a foothold. So it helps protect from disease organisms in the soil. Those disease organisms in part are also there because you've planted a tree in a, a place that's too wet. And so ground that's anaerobic uh, is gonna have more pathogenic organisms than one that's well drained. That spring feeder root flush is only gonna last <coughs> two to three weeks. And nutrients are being taken up now to grow this year's crop and also to grow next year's flower cells. So those are two very, very important things. And there's actually like an autumn that takes place in somewhere around mid-June where those feeder roots just slough off the tree. The, the root system may keep up to 10% of them to extend its permanent root system, but most of them fall away. And the mycorrhizal fungi, still there, but they also recede because the whole nutrient uptake thing is not happening then. And when mycorrhizae fungi send forth their filaments to gather nutrients from afar, they're rigid enough 
to be there because they have a carbon sugar-like substance called glomulin coating them. And when they withdraw, that glomulin is left behind. And this is what starts to help sandy soils bind together a little bit more and help spread clay soils apart. So it's these kinds of things you don't have to know, but it, it's cool to realize it's through the biology that you start to really improve soil in many different ways. So let me let me talk about biological mowing, and I think we need to walk around a little bit. Oh no, let me finish with that <laughs> root fly. So they fall off, and pay attention, mid June or so shoots start to grow again and when a shoot grows it means that there's new leaf tissue again so when we talk about disease cycles of things like apple scab but even more so something like cedar apple rust a lot of fungal diseases do best on young leaf tissue that's three to nine days old so once a tree is totally at the end of the growing season you're not going to get so much new infection as you do in spring that, that's part of why spring is such a a matter of concern but but there's kind of this tail blip after bloom where there's new leaf tissue that shows so if you're having a problem with late scab getting in even though you protect it early or particularly cedar apple rust it's probably tied to the fact that young tissue is now available again so those shoots now get to be 12 inches 16 inches or so that's kind of the ideal range in a bearing tree they might be a little shorter if you don't have quite so much fertility and if you really overdid it, maybe they're three to four feet in length, but there's a balance point we look for. But somewhere around mid-August, those shoots stop growing. This is what we call terminal bud set. So terminal bud set's really important in the cycle of a tree, because this is when the hardening off for the winter to come begins. And a tree works, that hardening off of tissues works its way back through the limbs and the branches and the trunk of the tree down to the roots, so that by the time really cold weather comes on, the tree can handle it. And this is why in just going into harvest, during harvest, we don't do something like prune, because that would stimulate growth. We want the tree to harden off. Um, peaches are an exception, in a sense, and we can talk about peach pruning. Um, this is why when I talk about spraying foliar fish, liquid fish, in the spring, I stop by July. And I don't do it again until that fall holistic spray because fish is high in nitrogen. I don't want to like really boost nitrogen levels when the tree is hardening off because I'm going to delay that hardening off. And so the ability of that tree to take winter cold, there's some common sense things that we should just understand not to do. And if you just understand now that don't prune at harvest time, great, <laughs> that's fine. But this is the why of that. Um, <laughs> the fact that that terminal bud set and the shoot is no longer elongating tells you something. Nothing's happening up top. That's when the fall feeder root flush begins. So we've now worked our way through the whole cycle of what the tree is doing in terms of its feeder roots. And, and just that notion, you know, up here, we see the leaves green and summer takes place and come fall, everything turns color and falls off. But that happens twice underground each year. It's kind of mm -hmm. cool to think about. Biological mode. <laughs> so here in, in some of these permaculture beds, it's more kind of permanent taproot plants and things like comfrey and <coughs> um, a lot of different berry bushes growing in the vicinity. That's a different setting than what I'm going to describe as more of a meadow ecosystem. So I have comfrey around my trees as well, but I, I haven't gotten quite into an interplanting thing to the same degree. And so I have all sorts of species growing there, and in one sense I can call it the grass, but it's a meadow ecosystem. So there's Queen's Anne's lace, and, and there's some lupins out there, and there's black Susan, black-eyed Susan daisies, and, and there's yarrow. There's, there's many, many different things happening, including grass, including red clover. Um, and so when the grass grows, in the broad sense, I'm using that word, in the spring, those who mow right away and didn't do much with leaf decomposition keep the sky open to those leaves to release spores. But as grass starts to get thick, the leaves down here cannot necessarily spore, get the spores up into the air as well. Some of that is blocked. So it's to our advantage to let 
the sward grow in the spring. And right off the bat, it's really green, it's really high in nitrogen. And if you think about the oat plant, it's a really it kind of makes this really visual. The oat plant first grows after you seed it, really green, high in nitrogen. And as it starts to send up its seed stalk, it starts to turn a little bit more golden. So it goes from high nitrogen to more of an equilibrium between carbon and nitrogen. And then when that seed fully matures, the plant turns totally gold and, and we can cut straw. When we take fresh off the oat grain, we're left with straw, which is really carbon rich. So there's a transition from nitrogen rich to carbon rich. And when it's just starting to set seed, at the time when a farmer would traditionally cut the first cutting of hay because just setting seed was an indication of optimum protein value for the forage, um, that carbon to nitrogen ratio in plant matter hits a place where it's on the order of 40 to 1, that fungal sweet spot. So when I come in right after fruit set in those couple of weeks following petal fall and mow with a sigh, I'm laying down a mulch that isn't all chopped to bits, it's going to last, last, that has a carbon to nitrogen ratio right where I want it. Now another aspect that's going on. Every cubic foot of soil has a certain density of roots in it. And in a meadow ecosystem, this mixture of deep tap-rooted plants, some clover, some grass, all these different plants I'm growing, um, that root density is such that apple roots and apple feeder roots in particular find plenty of room in the humus. And it's in that top several inches of soil where this nutritional biological action is maximized. This is where the partially built carbohydrates are found that help it be more, have more of an immune function. And conversely, in a grass setting where it's mown once a week or on that order, and so the tap-rooted plants, other than dandelion, mostly don't thrive in that setting because they no longer they get their tops cut off too regular. Grass can respond to that. Pure grass has a root density 20 times more than that meadow ecosystem. So this is not even so much a question about room in the humus. It's about what roots do. So roots, as part of the respiration process, respire carbon dioxide. So in a, in a very diverse meadow kind of ecosystem or in that permaculture fruit guild planting, not only is there room in the humus, so to speak, but the amount of carbon dioxide given off by the roots is, let's call it, a level of one. And apple feeder roots don't mind that. But underneath that mown grass, 20 times denser, the amount of carbon dioxide is 20 times denser. And so feeder roots sense that, and rather than being up in the humus, not just because of spatial reasons, they dive deeper down. And deeper down is where feeder roots take up their nutrition in the form of soluble ions. And that's okay, but it's not the partially car built carbohydrates that allow the tree to have excess energy to put more into its ability to suppress disease through phytochemical immune function. So again, it's a lot of thoughts there. But I want to take advantage of not too much carbon dioxide. If you really want to grow trees in a mown grass setting, that's fine. Just know you need more medicine to deal with the diseases. You're still kind of stuck there. We're changing that paradigm, but we can only do it by taking advantage of all the kinds of connections that nature speaks to. So here I have access in the humus layer which I'm going to enhance, because when I don't mow regularly, but come in and mow once, I shock the root systems, and the root systems of many plants also retract somewhat. So I make more room in the humus. So when I go around a tree with my sigh, and I have steep ground and rocky ground, so a sigh. Do, do you have a European sigh here? Yeah. We could look at that. Mm -hmm. So sighs come in two types. There's the American sigh that has this curved handle, and to use it, you kind of have to bend your spine in the same curve, and it's, it's not that much fun. Mm -hmm. But there's also the European sigh, the Austrian sigh, that has a straight snap. And so you get to stand erect and vertical and work with this sigh. So when I come in around a tree, I go around and sigh things out from underneath the canopy, and then I come back the other way and sigh this way, and I build 
kind of a mulch ring around the drip line of the tree. Mm -hmm. A mulch ring compo composed of plant material that's got that right carbon to nitrogen ratio for the fungal ecosystem I want. I'm shocking root systems at a time when feeder roots are just coming in to gather nutrition. And so that's what I call biological mowing, because it's all about being able to just tie into what the tree is doing to support that system. You know, in a larger orchard with flatter ground in mind, instead of a sai, the ideal is a sickle bar, because you're laying down that mulch in a thicker mat, again, to suppress grass a little bit longer. So that's biological mowing. <laughs> Similarly, one other thing in that, that aspect. The spring feeder root flush ends, feeder roots slough off. So if, if you're growing dwarf trees, and these are trees that by, because of the nature of their runted roots, that's why they're a smaller tree. They typically need to be staked or trellised because they don't have the strength to necessarily hold up a crop load. Plus it allows a certain kind of training to induce productivity earlier. Um, these are trees that need to have not so much competition. So that, that works really readily in an IPM orchard because herbicides keep things open. Herbicides, of course, make things very bacterial. And when you add fungicide sprays to the mix, fungicide sprays drip into the soil and destroy the saprophytic fungi and the mycorrhizal fungi. This is why you now need more sprays to compensate for that. This is why when we get into talking about disease management, uh, in organic growing, organic mineral fungicides are used, things like sulfur and copper. And so if there are growers who may make as many as 20 to 30 such sprays in a season to deal with disease. Well, in that system, it, it's not really a change of mindset. It's just a substitution of something that's considered certifiable, organic, naturally derived, true. But that excess sulfur, that copper, also impacts the fungi we want in the soil. And, and there's a place where with a few sulfur sprays, you can achieve nice looking fruit. And I was in that place for about 10 years, but I moved beyond that. Um, so to do this organically, we don't have the herbicide option. And ideally, we don't want to be relying on lots of organic mineral fungicides because it's going to work against what we're trying to do. Um, it's going to require more active mulching or some kind of compromise where you come in and you till the soil, you open the soil up with shallow tilling so other plants don't grow there as much. So last night I mentioned that if you really want to have dwarf trees, and we can talk about the advantages and not of different root systems, but you really want a smaller tree, you have a limited yard, well do it in a garden setting, a place where you hill potatoes or you harvest the garlic and then you're going to cover crop oats or you picked all the peas, you're going to cover crop oats. Think about when you do that stuff. Garlic gets harvested in July, the peas are all picked by that point. And when you come in to shallow cultivate, and here's your tree row in the midst of the garden with a wood chip kind of mulch bed two, three feet wide, and you're mulching out here, or you're tilling out here in July, that's the point when the feeder roots have sloughed off. So if you want to work the soil around fruit trees, it's tied totally to what the feeder roots are doing as well underneath there. And if we did that in early June, we'd be, yes, chopping up a good portion of the root system, the active root system of the tree. And we don't want to do that. So that also ties into how we manage. Good. More questions. I need more questions. So if you're converting um, what was a lawn and I'm sure treating all kinds of stuff to a, a natural organic environment, after a few years you notice you have and I also have a forest edge to my property. So once I see that the soil is, is healthy enough for worms to live there happily, can I take a little bit of the soil from my forest edge with all different coast hardwood leaves and so on? And if I were to begin to continue to eradicate lawn around my trees, could I then in July, it sounds like, because I don't want to disturb the, the roots, the feeder roots, could I remove some of the lawn and and use some of the soil from the forest edge to improve the soil conditions? You could do that, or you could. So you're simply not cutting the grass, and other yeah. things are now growing. Yeah, it, it, I, I think over a 
six-year period, there's basically no grass left in the meadows, and all native plants are growing there. You know, like yellow, like uh, aspirin, like uh, black ice No, that, that, that's a good thing. So that's a, a Sometimes, but um, in a commercial orchard, it's not unusual for us to use tractors. Tractors mm -hmm. can pack the soil. And I need my tractor to, to apply my sprays. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> my whole orchard grounds is not totally a fungal-dominated ecosystem. There's the fungal dust zone of the trees, but there's the aisleway where I'm going with the tractor and it's more compacted. Now, I'm not, I mow that once or twice more than I do under the tree. Under the trees, it's, it says two times, the sighing in the spring feeder root flush time and the total decomposition in the fall feeder root flush time. But I mow my aisleways a couple more times in the summer just so I have more access. And, and I do it wisely in that I don't mow every aisleway on the same day. I'm aware that certain flowering plants are valuable to the pollinators and to the beneficial species. So um, wisely means mow every two weeks mm. alternate rows. Or, you know, it's just always being conscious of the big picture of things. Mm -hmm. But that's a bacterial place. And in some orchards, they will mow that even more. But that's a place where you also might come in every several years and, if not cover crop it, um, at least run like harrows or something down to break up the grass sod so more plants come into that mm -hmm. ecosystem. Mm -hmm. But you've achieved that by not mowing, and that's, that's great. Yeah. I mean, simply not mowing is not all the whole story of why you have earthworms and things, but it, it's more like certain applications are no longer being made right. that hurt so those much. populations. Yeah. Right. It seemed like you used uh, crushed stone for mulch. Is that just when you first planted trees? So around the base of my trees, <coughs> I use a pea stone mulch, and that serves a couple purposes. Um, as a young tree, It doesn't have the branch structure to suppress things in that zone. And so it might be that first spring that I get the pea stone down. It may not be to the next spring, but I want to get it down. And I usually do more like a two-foot circle, um, and I do it a few inches deep. That's going to suppress most annuals in that ring. You know, if there's quack grass, that's going to come in there, but usually it's, it's, I can pull that out pretty easily. It's going to keep grasses and whatever plants growing from right against the trunk. And that has, that can be troublesome because it can keep that area a lot wetter. So if you're in wet ground, that could be a part of the collar rot issue. Um, but even more so, there's this beetle called the round-headed apple tree borer, and not everyone's gonna have this, but it likes seclusion. It likes to be able to hide. So the thicker the grass around the trunk, the more it has that opportunity to do its thing without you being aware of it. So I want to keep that open for these various reasons. I also like the pea stone because I can wiggle my Volgard, which in my cast case is a plastic mesh. You might use a hardware cloth, a metal mesh, but again, you're protecting from the voles in the winter. And if it's a mesh-type Volgard, it's not one you have to remove in the summer, where if you choose to buy those spirals, plastic wraps, that should be removed because there's not enough air getting to the trunk. So I can wiggle that into the pea stone. And being in zone four in the north country means I don't have the vigor. Trees don't grow at the same pace as they do in like zone six and seven and eight. And so I often come in like around year four or five, particularly if crack grass is an issue, kind of cultivate it and renew the pea stone. And then over the course of time as the tree's bigger and shading that area, some dandelion gets in there, but it never gets that thick anymore. And it still keeps things relatively open. So that's the reason I use the pea stone. How thick did you set them, sir? A few inches. Are beyond that, or is the wood mulch going on top of that pea stone later? So in the early years of a tree, <coughs> I have the pea stone right where it was planted. That first year, I might have put wood mulch and incorporated it some under the pea stone. Um, but that wood mulch is going to go, or hay mulch, like a ring donut, just to grow wood structure for several years. And and if it's, it's wood mulch, I probably don't tend to get involved with it too much. If it's hay mulch and crack grass is getting in there or it's fall, I usually pull that back and that's how I start to enlarge the circle around the tree uh, by working it and, and that combination of mulching. And over the course of five, six years, the tree gets big enough that that zone stays more open and 
I get away from that concept of ring mulching. And now it's more the haphazard mulching. And when I drop a load of soil on a tree that the tree's trunk is right in the middle of the fire pit and the eventual canopy, I've allotted it an eight inch radius, is bigger than these stump circle. Um, that tree's only as big as the rocks now, but that load might go here or here. It's not necessarily going in there against the trunk zone. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm kind of building the diameter of my fungal mm -hmm. duff zone as the tree goes over the course of several years. Hardwood bark is a mulch? <coughs> or is a component of mulching? Hardwood bark is something you might find at a landscape center. No, just, just not at a landscape center, but because there's a bunch of tree operations going on or whatever, you just got access to it. So, I would utilize that because you have access to it. And I know it's not going to be really rich in tannins like softwood bark. And so there's going to be some good things. On the other hand, it's not going to be like the soluble lignans and the whole kind of that um, fungal bloom, so to speak, that takes place with fresh wood chips. But whether they're fresh or aged, hardwood bark I would certainly utilize. Another thing, again, think forest edge and... I chip, and not chip, split wood, and when you split wood, bark comes off, and big hunks of wood, the bigger ones you gather for kindling, but some of the bigger other splinters are there, and yes, that's like all carbon, it's wood, and I rake up a wheelbarrow load, that's where I go out on my topography, and here's a little low spot, and I just dump it there, because that happens on the forest edge, you know, a branch falls. What about chopped leaves? I often... <coughs> I bring in a lot of other deciduous leaves besides the apple. I use those more in making compost and animal bedding than I do. I've never really gone and dumped a bag of. I do it for both. Leaves. I'm just wondering any downside to. I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. Mm. I just again, it's like how much do you have of things and where do you mm. direct it? How deep um, do you want the fall compost to be? And yes. You wanted uh, the entire diameter around the tree. Uh, I would say yes. So that I was almost I almost talked about that. I remember that now. <laughs> <laughs> when you are returning the leaves that fall off that tree, and you are returning whatever you prune off that tree for the most part, snipping it in. You know, I I snip some of the shoots in a sense. But bigger branches I take off, I come back with my chipper and shoot the chips under the tree. I don't drag the branches out. But when you're returning all those things, and you're also growing tap-rooted plants, or you, you've planted it in a clear, cleared pasture setting, and uh, an overgrown forest setting, and you come in and you brush mow all the stump sprouts that are coming up, all of that is part of the fertility loop. So the maintenance rate of compost is actually not that much, relatively speaking. And it's on the order of two tons per acre. So two tons of compost, um, unless it's totally water sogged, is equivalent to about four cubic yards of compost. And if we do the math of cubic feet in those cubic yards, I think it's like 108 cubic feet. And when I talked about that eight-foot diameter tree, I talked about 110, 120 trees per acre. So it's, it's really a question of one cubic foot of compost per tree, which is like one and a half to two full five-gallon buckets full. It's not that much, relatively speaking. If you have more compost and you can do four to six buckets under that whole tree diameter, great. But just from the perspective of renewing some of the nutrition that's been taken away in the crop and restoring everything else, it's not that much that you really need. So where to will you add want to, to that. concentrate it? So here's know. this tree ring. Yep. And I have maybe done the lime thing, maybe not. But I've come in and I've chopped leaves with my brush mower. And I've run around the outside and blown grass and leaves down here. I come in with my, and I don't literally take two five-gallon buckets of concrete. I have a wheelbarrow or my track it, tractor mm -hmm. bucket. And I take the shovel. And I throw some there, and maybe it's four or five or six throws. And I don't like 
young tree and just here, but it's the whole drip line zone, the fungal duff zone that I'm going to manage over the course of time. So even with a young tree, I throw it because I'm starting to build the soil further out where that tree eventually is going to fill that whole space. So that's how I'm, I'm applying compost and thinking about it. That doesn't mean that in the early years doing a thin veneer of wood chips as part of that building soil process further out is not a bad idea. Um, but for me it's, it's kind of quadrant based in that not that I cover this whole quadrant with ramial wood chips but here's where I dump a pile and, and maybe here and then three, four years later it's more like on this side. It's, it's, it's changing, it's shifting, but it's, it's a dump. And if, if you don't like that and you really need a precise recipe, then you would never want to come cook with me. I planted my trees on the northeastern slope, and um, I sort of ground up the low side, and I've got, um, let's see, um, mm, mulch hay and compost and chips and stuff on top. Now, um, somebody said, well, you need to, to have a little breach there so that water doesn't freeze in the center when the tree has maybe been there for a year. And you don't want to have this freezing going on with those beetle roots being established. So, Are you talking about having like a shallow bowl around the tree? Yeah, yeah something like that. Right. And do you see water permanently puddle that it would freeze on top like that? It, it could, it didn't, it was okay. I think this guy just wanted to be part of what was going on, and that was his history with it. But um, <coughs> my question is more about um, the higher berm on that lower side of the slope. Is that something that you would recommend? I like the concept of building terraces. It depends on the steepness of the ground and when ground's mm -hmm. really undulating. Mm -hmm. There's those veils that I might do even more extreme terracing. And, and one of the ways I like to build that berm is with woodsy debris being rotting logs, whether they're softwood or hardwood in the forest, because they're rotting. That means they're well along in decomposition. And even branches, whether it's pruning from my orchard or the ground I'm clearing, I don't necessarily chip it. But as long as I then go and bury that woodsy debris, whether that's big round bales of hay that I roll out over or I have compost or a couple dumps of wood chips on top. What I'm doing is creating a, a, a humic bank, so to speak, that's going to be there for years and years to come that the mycorrhiza and the feeder roots are going to get a lot of nutrition from. Mm -hmm. And that, that concept in permaculture is called hugel culture. Sometimes utilized to build raised beds for gardening, but I like to use it primarily in orcharding to build more of a terrace. And, and there are people with flatter ground who do it more like a literal bank and they're raising the ground around their trees but I really like it when it flows on the land and you've got a slight slope and you've built this little berm and here's the tree row and then the next berm and the tree row but it makes a lot of sense to me and often I am clearing land of shrubby brush and, and small trees and to, in the old days I burned all that brush you know and I didn't know anything now I understand I don't even have to chip it if I have that kind of setting where I can bury it. So mm -hmm. that all ties into what your land looked like and what resources do you have, you know, and, and that's important. If I could add to that, because we run into that problem when we're planting trees around, we build the mulch rings on the slope and often use cardboard and you know, do a heavy mulch ring. And I think what we've run into is situations where it more or less dams the water and so it creates a puddling effect versus I think the goal is more infiltration. And some of it is like in the profile, just plant doing your mulching and then sort of gently raising up that, that root base in the center. And also, if it's on a slope, figuring out ways to maybe shed that water in that ring, just making a relief or some such so it just doesn't puddle, you know, a couple inches deep and can infiltrate well. And then my question of the day is, I just want to get more in tune with the um, succession of the season. And it seems like this this knowledge base you have of what's going on visually in the aerial portions of the tree, as well as sort of the knowledge of what's going on in the root zone, is r really interesting to me. So any tidbits you can share about 
like where we are in these progressions and that sort of thing. It's like what are where are we right now? Well, right now we are at full bloom. Uh, some of the fruits are at petal fall. So some are at the point where shoots have stopped elongating, like the pears are not in that. So they're doing their feeder root flush. On the apple trees, that's going to happen in another week, week and a half, where it'll enter that two to three week phase. But it's, you know, when we talk about the orchard calendar, we could, in this circle, almost use terms like the month of April, the month of May, the month of June, but mm -hmm. in truth, from the tree calendar perspective, it's about the bud stage. So when I describe for apple, quarter inch green, half inch green, that's the fruit buds on an apple tree come into green before the leaf buds do. And when they're that tall, <laughs> up to half inch green, we have a name for that. And there are, are certain things I do at that time, and it doesn't matter if you live in California or Plymouth, New Hampshire, when we're talking bud stages, for you in California, that might happen the end of February, early March. And here it's going to be more mid-April, um, late April. But it's still talking bud stages. And we go from there to the flower buds. You can see them, but they're kind of tightly together. That's called tight cluster to open cluster showing a little bit of color, early pink to pink, to the one in the center opening, that's the king blossom. Ideally, that's the one that you always see great pollination weather when the king blossoms are opening because it's going to have a, as much as a weak jump start on the side blossoms. You know, that's nature's way of building in some insurance. If a frost comes and takes out the king blossom, um, there's going to be secondary and tertiary bloom that might get picked up. Um, but if you have perfect king blossom pollination, and you don't see insect damage to that or pest damage on that, that in turn means you really don't want the second and the third flowers to set fruit. And when we look at a fruit tree and flower, if every one of those flowers set, mm -hmm. um, it would mean a lot of golf balls if they even got that big. Mm -hmm. And it would mean typically there's five flowers in an apple blossom cluster. Five golf balls growing tight together, which means there's a lot of hiding places for moths, so that second generation of species like red banded leaf roller or lesser apple worm, um, they might look really nice on the outside, but you pull the cluster apart and they're all like skin damage and riddled with holes. And part of that is because there's more hiding place. And then another aspect of that, if every flower set, an apple blossom is set up to produce 10 seeds. And so when a, a tree is, is growing fruit, that's our take on it, from its perspective, it's growing seeds so it can reproduce itself. And those seeds require a certain amount of nutrients and hormones to be formed. And one of the hormones that's created to produce that seed is gibberellic acid hormone. And so on a tree that is growing one apple in a cluster, the others didn't get pollinated or were removed. Um, that tree at the same time, any tree at the same time, is not only growing this year's fruit, but apple and pear are also in the spur where the flower cell comes off of, where the fruit bud is found on the tree. In the tip of that spur, in the meristem, cell initiation begins at the same time. A little fruit grows from the size of a pea to a marble to a nickel cell initiation begins to form next year's flowers. And if there's a lot of apples being grown this year, from the tree's perspective, that means a lot of seeds. That means really high levels of gibberellic acid hormone. And that totally inhibits the formation of next year's flower cells. So when you look at a wild tree and you tell me how there was such a great crop last year and now this year there's not a thing, it has nothing to do with like some kind of weather extreme or cold in this past winter, or no pollinators this current spring. It's totally about a year, well, nine, ten months ago, mm -hmm. when those fruit formed that were that bumper crop, which meant times ten, all those seeds, high levels of gibberellic acid hormone meant no flower cells were formed for next year. So when we talk about, when we talk about growing different fruit and pruning, 
part of what we do in terms of thinking about pruning is understand where the flower cells are missing. So with, with the peach, it's totally off of one-year-old wood that you're going to have flowers. So wood, the part of the shoot that gets to be two or three or four years old, no longer has flowers. So there's a way we prune to keep having one-year-old wood close to the tree rather than going further and further out. With an apple and a pear tree, there are some tip bearers. They bear on the tip of shoots. But for the most part, they're spur bearers or a combination. And those spurs can have fruit for 20, 30, even 40 years, but it's younger wood that's going to grow more vigorous fruit. But it's in those spurs that flower cells form. And so part of the act of balance is within the first 30 to 40 days after petal fall, when the blossoms come off and little fruit are setting, if we come in and thin the crop, so I'm now talking about a really heavy setting apple, and by thinning I mean literally pulling off excess fruitlets, we are going to ensure that we have a crop next year. And we're also going to ensure that we don't grow all these golf balls with all these hiding places. And it takes, uh, it can take several years of, of messing this up to really appreciate it and understand it. But when you look at that tree with all those flowers, there is a lot of extra built into it. And it's only going to take 3 to 5% of those blossoms to have a full crop on that tree. Mm -hmm. So that means, in one sense, if there was such a thing as Peculio School and Codling Moth School and European Apple Sawfly School, and we could teach the insects to leave an apple every four to eight inches along the branch <laughs> and just take eat all the others, that would be perfect, but it doesn't work that way. And so we come in as growers to thin the crop. So the relevance with apple and pear is that you're making possible next year's crop. So there are varieties that don't set really heavy and tend to be really annual bearers anyway. Uh, I still will thin on them, but when you if you're growing something like Fuji or Paula Red or Gala, you can think of varieties that you see almost every fruit is set. Mm -hmm. And you have to come in and, and literally remove as much as 80-85% of those fruit lips. That's pretty painful and it, it seems like you're you go through this thing of thinking, well, he said that, but he doesn't really know. I'm going to <laughs> so many apples. But there's a relationship between the number of leaves on the trees and the number of fruit that can be grown properly. And it takes 20 to 25 leaves to grow a fruit. So no one counts leaves. But it's interesting to know because that's another aspect of it. That's where balance is found. And you will grow enough big fruit to fill just as many bushel boxes, if not more, if you were to pick all the golf balls that are bug ridden. So that's also just to appreciate that. But you will see that if you're assertive and aggressive about this, on most all varieties, you can keep it in annual bearing. There are ones like Baldwin, which is just even if you remove leaf fruit every 12 plus inches along the branch, it tends to take a year off anyway. And that's really a tendency of that particular variety. But thinning is, is a big part of this. And when we talk about, uh, when I get into insects and I talk about, we'll identify what are maybe the, the chief pests at your place and certain things that you can do to tame that down. You know, I'm going to try, I try really hard to not use the word control. I, I don't like that notion that I'm a human and I'm going to control the situation. So I try to use words like balance and nudge and tame. But over the course of a, several years, when you come onto a property, this is not a property where you planted the tree and you're doing things from the get-go. Ideally, you're doing things from the get-go and that's going to keep things more in balance. But when you're coming in and the situation has been left go out of control, um, those first several years when you're thinning the crop for all the reasons I just spoke of, you will see brown frass coming out of fruit. And that can be the codling moth, it could be the sawfly. You'll also see little holes and, and crescent cuts over those holes. That's representative of the coculia. And those larvae are going to be in those fruits for on the order of two to three weeks. So in terms of thinning for next year's flowers, 
you really have about 35 to 40 days after floral initiation. And if you're on top of it in the first week or two of that, you're probably not doing much thinning because the fruit's really small. Um, it's harder to, to get in there and pick them off. You might do some, but, but you'll find it, it's not quite as, as easy, and particularly with varieties that have really short stems. But there's a point where it gets to be more like the size of a marble, that they pop off more readily. But that's also the point where we've entered into that two to three window of where the larva is in the fruit. So you go into a blossom cluster, and again, the king blossom, this is the point where with the king blossom, I like to usually raise my fingers and I have to be careful that the king blossom is not that one. So, <laughs> anyway, that's it. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. <laughs> um, Ideally, the king blossom, the king blossom, is the one that you don't see any damage to, and you get to leave that one because it has a weak start on things. But if that's damage, you're going to pluck that. And this one is soft fly. Well, and I'll explain soft fly. Soft fly might have gotten every one of them, uh, or scab starts to show up at this point too. So if I see scab in this apple, but not this one, and there's no, but I'm going to. That's the one I'm going to leave. But these ones that were damaged, and again. There'll come a point where through doing the types of things I talk about, you don't see that much mm -hmm. of this. Mm -hmm. But in those early years, you have a great opportunity to start to clean up the pest situation at your site in that the larva, which need to get into the soil, in the case mm -hmm. of sawfly, in the case of the coolio, codling moths would crawl out and find another place to pupate, usually under the bark. But they're in those fruitlets. Mm -hmm. And when you thin, if you're wearing a sack on the side of your leg or you have a bucket and you put them, gather them, you can do a couple of things with them. One, you don't go and throw them into your compost pile unless you're into turning and generating a lot of heat. But otherwise, you're just saying, okay, let's not pupate in the soil under my tree here, pupate over here because you have a cold pile. No, you want to do something else. So if you have piglets, they're going to get most of that. Chickens probably will get the majority of those um, before the larva can crawl out. Or, you know how you might have heard, may not know directly, this, this notion of crop circles in the Midwest, mm -hmm. or a big wheat field and it's all flattened in a circle and the flying saucer came and who knows what caused that. <laughs> well, in my early years, on Lost Nation Road, these big brown circles would appear on the blacktop road. And that was where I dumped a bucket of infested fruitlets, <laughs> and then the cars went over it. And no one had any idea where these big brown circles were coming from. But I was making sure I was destroying that larva. So now I hardly see that much damage. I might see a limb where saw has been heavy, and then I might go get a bucket. Or I might just be close enough to stick them in my pocket, and then I throw them on the road or my driveway, because I know that's just too hot and not favorable to their development. But for the most part, I just drop them to the ground because I, I don't have things to be concerned about. You've reduced the population in the year of the time. I think so. But again, it's I'm not just doing the thinning. There's other intelligence to come with this. Um, is, is it a problem, is it a disadvantage for me if I live near a 70,000 tree orchard that is very so most most of the chemicals yeah. directed at insects in IPM orchards are to kill. Okay. So the pest okay. the pest numbers if it's done according to the rules of IPM um, may not be increased by that. On the other hand, those sprays are also killing a lot of the bugs that help keep some of those things in check. Mm -hmm. So some of those pests don't move that far. Um, like maybe a hundred yards for apple maggot fly or European apple mm -hmm. sawfly. Other pests, like any moth, can get caught in the wind and move further. Mm -hmm. um, so it depends on how close and some mm -hmm. of the edge dynamics in terms of some of the good guys that are left. 
But in terms of, of your place, regardless of how close or not, your place is going to become a, a beneficial sanctuary. You know, a good IPM orchardist actually understands this, and you will find in really large orchards of 100, 200, 300 acres, an acre or two where they don't spray, because that's where the mite predators are going to come from, and some of the bracken and wasps. And, and that's wisdom. That's good. But they're trying to compensate in a situation that's rather desperate, where you're going to start to create the kind of habitat that encourages a lot of connections, which is a big part of when I talk about long-term balance. That's really important. We're, we're going to get into that. We're